deep learning algorithm where you don't know how it works internally to like, I don't know, trigger your airbag, right? Uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so yeah, this is something really to consider. And I think that if you put a bit of brains into, into the modeling aspects, you can get pretty good results also with classical machine learning. So what are the example questions that we could work with, right? Um, I just want to give you some ideas. So for example, is this movie a romantic comedy or an action movie? I will use this example sometimes in the slides because it's a nice illustration. Then uh, we can ask, yeah, would you survive a trip with the Titanic? So <laughs> we can calculate like your chance of survival, right? Or how many hours of TV do you watch per day? Or what is the water level um, for the Danube gonna be tomorrow? So I think this is sometimes interesting in Passau to know. And there are actually some forecast systems for that in place already. So what are the basic assumptions that I make? So I assume that your data is organized in some kind of table where the rows are the single observations and where the columns are the features. Uh, features are basically the attributes. So for example, for the Titanic data set, we have the age of a participant, we have the, uh, the price that they paid for the ticket, we have the passenger class and so on. And then basically the rows would be the individual participants. And my, the assumption that you usually have to make there is that you have a lot more rows than you have columns. But that also is typically the case because normally you have more observations than you have features. Yeah? And then uh, sometimes I will use the word label in this talk. So the label is an extra column. So basically we have this, I don't know, is this drawing? No, okay, so, no, sorry. Ah, now it's drawing. So we have like this table, right, where we have the, the observations and we have the features. And then we have a second vector. And for the Titanic, that will just say whether that person died or whether they survived. That's called the label. And this is usually the most costly part about your data because this label is hard to get. But you will need it for supervised learning methods um, in order to learn the model and then later when, to, when you want to calculate what performance your model has, you, you also uh, need a label because otherwise you don't know whether the model was right or not, right? So, uh, and then the third assumption is that your da the data that you have available for learning is representative for the underlying process. What I mean by that is that if you have this kind of data, right? and you want to build a model, you probably build a model like this red line. Uh, but then I assume that this is really true and that in, like when I now start testing the model, also the data should be in this range like the blue data is, right? And not kind of grow here, yeah? Then it would not be representative for, for the rest of the data. So the thing is that in the real world, the, one of the problems is that usually you don't know, you cannot guarantee that it's representative, but if you have a large enough sample size, it's fair to assume that it's representative, right? And um, you can, for example, do a t-test and do like statistical testing to ensure that you have enough samples, for example. Um, so then what does our pipeline look like? So a lot of people have this kind of picture in mind that, and I think this is a fallacy, so maybe you disagree, but most people think that, okay, we get the data, it's like 10%, we built our awesome data lake last year, right, with uh, 100,000 euros, and then now we, we can focus like 80% of our time to build like the best estimator, uh, and then we spend 10% on like, I don't know, visualizing the results and making a nice PowerPoint presentation, right? But in my opinion or in my experience, this does not happen at all like that. So what happens typically is that you spend about 20% of your time at least with the data acquisition, depending on where your data comes from. Then you spend the majority of time, like 40, 50%, but there, there's really no upper limit in pre-processing your data. So the data is never 
clean, so you have to clean it first, and then you have to yeah, format the data in a way that is useful to you. Uh, and then you apply an estimator, but then you already lost so much time that you only have 20% time left, right, for your estimator. Uh, then you do some post-processing and then uh, you finally, you know, have time for your PowerPoint presentation because in the end you want to make sure that you get money for your next project, right? So, how does that work? So, the data acquisition phase, basically you either have to make measurements yourself, so during my time as a PhD student, I had to do this quite a lot, so after building these like wearable systems, you have to find participants and then write a study protocol and get it approved and then, you know, do the recording. So this is quite time consuming. Sometimes you can find data on the web, so you can write like a nice script that pulls the data from the web or you have a customer that says, hey, I use this SAP product, so for example, right, have this big database in the basement and we have the cleanest data you've ever seen and it's so well organized and then you go there and it turns out that, yeah, they have a lot of data, but, you know, it takes you like a week to sort through it. Um, sometimes you have to do some resampling, so sometimes, yeah, for example, if you have electricity measurements once per second, but you want to, I don't know, calculate the yearly average or you want to average it, right? So you have to do resampling and then you store it in a database or a file or whatever you want. So today we use uh, comma separated value files. That's like one of the simplest methods. But if your data set gets bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah, you want to, so there's, for example, this uh, HDF store, so it's still a file, but it's like a database and a file, then you can have a SQLite database, and then, I don't know, if it gets really big, like get some more fancy database, right? But what's really important is that the quality of your data is really of essence. If your data is not good, then there's no point in, in spending the other 80% of the time. Then really spend the time to get proper data so for example here, like this would be the example data set, right? There's like five movies and let's pretend I watched all of them and I counted the number of kisses in the movie and I counted the number of kicks in the movie. And then I looked up on IMDb, is this a romantic comedy or an action movie, right? And I wrote it down. Then this would be my data set, right? That's the assumption. So you have the, the rows like this. You have the columns, then I would have these two would be my features, right? And this would be my label, right? Okay, so then we go to the pre-processing step. So in the pre-processing step, you spend actually a lot of time looking at the data first to understand how are things distributed, what feature columns that you have are useful. Uh, maybe you have to apply, for example, time windowing. So if you have a time series, you make little windows uh, over time of your data and then you compute some statistics, for example, mean, median, variance, stuff like that. Or you have to transform your time series into the frequency domain, get some uh, features there, or you transform it with PCA or you perform some other kind of dimensionality reduction. So for my uh, movie example, it's quite simple. I was quite lucky, I <laughs> picked the right features. Um, so this is called a scatter plot. So you see here two features, right? One on each axis and uh, on the y-axis is the number of kisses per movie, on the x-axis is the number of kicks. And then I use the label column to color the points to understand whether these classes are separate, separatable or not. Because in the end, the estimator needs to be able to separate these two classes, right? I want to understand what is this a romantic comedy or is this a action movie? And then in the end, yeah, sometimes you have a lot of features if you generate them automatically with a script. So I did this before with accelerometer data from, from a smartphone. You can generate a lot of statistical features over these windows of time, and maybe you have like 700 columns right in your data set, but then you don't want to confuse your classifier with all this data, so you want to select the relevant ones. So there's also algorithms for that. And that step would be called feature selection. Um, so this, I think, is the most important part. So 
if you have bad features, so if you have bad data, you're going to have bad features. If you have good data and you have bad features, you still don't get a good result. So there you really need to spend your time exploring the data set, understanding what is important and what is not. Yeah. And then finally you get to the estimator. <laughs> So the estimator is basically your decision algorithm and for example here it could be this line that I draw there that separates the green from the blue dots because the estimator does not know the color of the dot, right? That's my label. So, but basically it would assume that if, the, if you watch a movie that has a lot of kisses and not a lot of kicks then it's a romantic comedy and if you watch a movie that where there's a lot of fighting and not a lot of kissing then no. Obviously, it's an action movie, yeah? Um, and for the estimator, so that would be an example for a classifier, right? Because it's a question where you can give a clear answer, right? So there's uh, the German word, the Schublade. So like a draw for every, uh, you think in categories there, right? So is this a cat or a dog? It's an action movie or a romantic comedy, right? Um, and whenever you have this kind of decision problem, you use a classifier. It can also be more than two categories, so that's not a problem, but it has to be clear categories. When you want to know something that's a continuous output, like for example if I was a cucumber farmer and I would measure the amount of rain throughout the season, right, and I would come to the conclusion that I had 30 liters per square meter of field uh, rain every month, then maybe I would like to forecast how many cucumbers I will have to harvest at the end of the season so I can, for example, plan how many helpers I need on the field, right? That would be a classic regression problem. So whenever there's a continuous output, it's a regression problem. And then there are spotters, they are a bit like classifiers, but they spot really rare events like fall detection, for example, right? Like most of the time you're hopefully not falling, right? You're like sitting, walking, standing, whatever, but falling should be maybe 0.01% of the time. So this is pretty hard to detect because you have a very unbalanced problem, right? So the classifier would basically say you're falling or you're not falling. And then kind of all the time, except for this 0 0.001% of the time, the classifier would say not falling, not falling, not falling, right? But then it's really hard for, for an algorithm to detect that one time where you're actually falling. It's a bit like the airbag in your car, right? So you want it to trigger if and only if you're in an accident. Yeah, it doesn't help you if it triggers sometimes <laughs> without an accident and you definitely don't want it to not trigger when you are in an accident. And then the fourth family is clustering. So clustering works without labels and it basically finds, it does what the name says, it, does, it finds clusters in your data. So for example, if you had an online shop and you would measure certain behavior, you could say, for example, split all my customers into four groups, right? And you want to, and then the algorithm would split it into four groups, but the thing is that you don't know what group, which group is which, yeah? And you don't know uh, kind of with what goal in mind the algorithm splits it. It just splits it into the four m groups where within the group the members are as similar as possible, but between the, but the groups are as dissimilar as possible, yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, so this you can use also sometimes as a classifier if you don't have labels or if you have only very few labels. Because what you do then is you train your clustering algorithm and in the end you kind of tell it, okay, this was the label. Of, so let's say you have 5% five, 5 labels. So for 5% of your data, you actually paid someone to sit down and watch all these movies and annotate whether there was a lot of kissing or rather a lot of fighting, yeah? And then you, for 5% of your data, you have that, you could do clustering, and then after the clustering, color all the, all the points of your data where you had the labels, and then you would see which cluster is which, yeah? And if it clustered it by this factor that you want to know. The good news is that 
yeah, at least with Python, you can use this stuff off the shelf. So you don't need to, I mean, it's good to understand the math behind it, but you don't need to implement it yourself. Yeah, there is implementation for everything, more or less, and they are already parallelized, so that makes computing fast and, and really, really convenient to use. So I will show examples later where you use the highest level of that library, and it's kind of, the estimator part is like three lines, yeah? So it's not really a big issue. And then we do post pro oh, sorry, there's more. So yes, I forgot to tell you. So the estimators that use labels, so classifiers, for example, they have these two modes of operation, right? So first, you need to show them a lot of examples with labels, that's called training, and then they have their model. They learn the model from that data, and then, yeah, you have the testing phase where you try to figure out how well your classifier works, or you use it in production, right, if you <laughs> trust it. Uh, yeah, they have usually a lot of tuning parameters, but in the end, if you have good data and you have good features and it's possible to classify your data, what estimator you pick or how you tune these parameters in the beginning is not that important. It's not the most important thing. You can, you can first see whether the classifier and your data and your features work. If you get a decent baseline, say, 70% or something, yeah, for a two-class problem, you can continue and start, you know, optimizing your features and then optimizing the parameters. But in the beginning, you shouldn't worry about this, about picking the right classifier, yeah. Maybe, you know, you think a bit about how they work internally, but there are a lot of very similar approaches and in the end, yeah, they're very alike. So. Post-processing is the next step. So I put this step in there because sometimes, you know, this result, whether it's a romantic comedy or, or an action movie is not enough. You want to derive a decision from that output, right? So assume I had an online shop and I would sell t-shirts and I wanted to order, and I'm very lazy, right? So I wanted to reorder the t-shirts automatically when, when I estimated the orders go up, right? So I would like, I don't know, monitor Twitter, monitor my sales, and then make a prediction for the next week. And if I figure out that the classifier says we, or the regressor would say, we sell 10 t-shirts and I only have five left in stock, I would want to do this automatically, right? So yeah, that's what I meant there with determine an automatic action, right? So I would basically, in that layer, yeah, implement a business logic that has to happen when I predict a certain outcome, yeah? Um, but that's not the scope of today. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the result layer, right? So, yeah, you present maybe a result to the user in a smartphone or web app, so you need to make it look a bit nice. Um, there are frameworks for that, like Borky, Dash, and Shiny for our users. So at work, I built a bunch of Shiny apps, and if someone asks the question later, I will show some of them. <laughs> but there was no time to fit it in the talk. So what does an example pipeline look like? So this is from one of my research uh, papers. So I was using eyeglasses that have a color sensor embedded in the, in the glass in the middle, and they don't, they don't uh, measure only light intensity, but they measure also like a separate light intensity for red, green, blue light, and then for all the light. So I built these features that I call virtual light channels. So where I divide uh, different, uh, yeah, different light channels by each other. So for example, the amount of red light divided by the amount of green light. Then uh, I performed something called sliding window segmentation. So I split basically the data into small windows of time. And then I compute um, features for every window, like mean variance and a lot of others. So I think there in the end, I had 725 features. So then it's a good time to perform feature selection because otherwise it's hard to, to pick the important features for your classifier. Yeah? So you, you have to think like you always, with every feature, you add one, one dimension. Yeah? So if you have a graph with three dimensions, that's the end for humans. So if you give the classifier something with 725 dimensions, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> uh, 
the problem is that a lot of times they measure distances between points, right? So if you have the Euclidean distance in a 725 um, dimension space, that gets sort of meaningless because any, there will be anything in there. Yeah? Um, and then the last step was the classification. I used a linear support vector machine and basically from that I got the information whether the person that's wearing the glasses is currently sitting in front of a computer screen or not. Um, that's interesting for other reasons you can ask that later as well. <laughs> um, so now I want to talk a bit about the common pitfalls um, when doing data analysis because I think that's really important to remember. So, huh. so the first one is over and underfitting. You probably heard about overfitting. Who has heard about overfitting? I forgot to do this audience question. Who has programmed in Python before? Okay, who has been doing like data science before? Okay, good, thanks. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically overfitting is when, so your classifier, right, when you train it, it sees some data, but it doesn't see all the data. Now, if you fit your classifier too much to the data that you see, right, the data that you will use for testing or in production later will be a little bit different and then your classifier doesn't generalize well anymore, right? And actually there's a slide, yes, this one. So for example, if I think Halloween is coming up soon, right? Um, if you want to buy a pumpkin for Halloween, <laughs> you will probably observe that uh, the price depends on the size of the pumpkin. And let's say you measured, the, so you went to the pumpkin store, <laughs> and you measure the, the size of pumpkins and you measure the price, right? And those are the five, um, so those are these uh, red points, the red crosses, right? And then you go home and you say, oh, I'm a data scientist now. Uh, I want to build a model that uh, predicts the price for any size pumpkin before Halloween. <laughs> and of course, the simplest way is, is uh, to put a line through all these points, right? A straight line. So, but then you can see what is called underfitting happening here. So you have your line, right? And it sort of works, but then the distances, right? The error in your prediction would always be this like straight down or up distance from that line, right? And you can see if you sum up all the distances of these lines, they're it's quite a lot of error, so maybe you're gonna spend two more money than expected on your Halloween pumpkin. <laughs> so then you say, okay, but the next year, right, you do the same thing again, and I say, this time I'm gonna do it better. I will use one degree of freedom more, right, for, for my equation, and so this is a classic regression problem, by the way. And then um, you take a function of the second order, and then, yeah, it works quite well, right? So, okay, so there is a bit of error, there's very little, right? Very little error. Okay, and then the next year, right, you do it again, because you still, yeah, <laughs> you want to see what's possible, and you say, this time I use the maximum number of orders. So, you use a fourth order model, right, on five data points. So, the thing is that if you've ever done lin linear algebra, uh, yeah, you can, you can, of course, find a perfect fit, yeah? Because with four orders, you can put it through five points, yeah? The thing is, though, that, I mean, we don't know for sure how these pumpkin prices behave, but the thing is that this part, right, that seems to make sort of sense, yeah? So, but this, this doesn't really, this doesn't really make sense, right? So, say it was really that line right, that we are trying to model, and then we buy a pumpkin that's that size, right, we would have a huge error, or this size, we would have a huge error, yeah, and that's what's called overfitting, and the thing is that you can only find out if you do careful testing, yeah, whether you're overfitting or not.
Mm, this is another example. So this is very similar, but with more more points, right? So of course you cannot. So here the appropriate fit it allows for some error, right? But this is a classification problem. So you try to split the x's and the o's, and in the end, yeah, you can maybe afford this, but you you cannot afford like this solution, right? Where it's like. Like you can see immediately that this is not going to be the perfect solution because if you keep adding points, you're going to have errors. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing that's really, really, really important that I hope you take home is cross validation. Yeah. Um, basically, if you train your model on your entire data set and then you test it on the same data set, that's not really a challenge, right? Because if I want to teach you the difference between a cat and a dog and I show you my dog at home, right? And the next day I bring my dog to work and I ask, is this a dog or a cat? Yeah, you will recognize that from yesterday. The challenge is to recognize like any other dog and any other cat, right? Uh, and so what you can do is you can split your data set into multiple parts. Like here for the example, it's done with four parts. So so this entire thing is my data set, right? It's all my cats and dogs. <laughs> and, and I split it into four parts that are equal size. And then I train my data set on the part number two, three, and four. And then I, I evaluate the performance on part one, yeah? And then if, if you're still following, you would say, ah, oh, but then you waste a quarter of your data, right? because you train your model only on 75%. So what you do is you perform the whole th experiment four times, yeah? So you, every time you use a different subset for training than for testing. So here you use the first one, there you use the second, the third, and the fourth. And in the end, you take the average performance and then you know how your model performs. And the other thing that's interesting to look at is this performance per run. So if you notice that they are very different, yeah? Say there was 80%, 20%, 80%, 80%, or 80%, 20%, then you know that something is kind of wrong, yeah? So either you don't have enough data in your data set when you train, or there are some special data points that tell a lot, or you were overfitting, yeah? And this is really important if you want to gain trust in your model, because yeah, it's, I think it's the only way that, that you can really trust your model because there you have the chance to test on previously unseen data, yeah? And it's also the number one thing I think that I've seen that consistently goes wrong and is underappreciated. <laughs> so really keep this cross-validation uh, thing in mind. Uh, measuring error. So there's the confusion matrix and... We will look at that anyway later in the code. There's different ways to measure error. There's, for example, accuracy, there's confusion matrices, there's precision, recall, and F1 score. Basically, uh, I think I will explain that in the example. It's easier, and we're running out of time. So the word, word on error metrics, it's really important to pick a, right, a, a good error metric. And by good, I don't mean one that produces the best result. Yeah. Because error metrics are all different and they're all there for a reason. So I assume that I want to do falling detection and 5% of all my data is falling and 95% is not falling, right? And I use accuracy. And I am smart and lazy. So I build a classifier that will always predict that I'm not falling, right? I would have an accuracy of 95%, right? But my classifier doesn't do anything. It doesn't learn anything from the data. It just returns you're not falling, yeah? So it's really hard to challenge yourself when you pick the error metric and look maybe also at different error metrics and then decide which one you put in your report or paper or whatever. That also, when you measure the error, you can do this uh, relative or absolute, so like in percent or in whatever unit you're measuring. Uh, that can be really helpful to look at what makes sense for your problem, yeah. Um, class skewed, by that I mean this thing that so heavily skewed, for example, would be this example where I have 
not falling and 5% falling, right? So that would be a strong, when there's a strong imbalance, we call that class skew. Um, yeah, don't just compute some mean error if you have multiple samples. Look at the errors for all your participants or all your samples and look also at the extremes and at the, at the distribution of error. Because especially if, say, you have an error that's two-sided, so I want to, for example, estimate the wake-up point, like the moment where you wake up uh, as, a, as a time, right? Then the error can be positive or negative minutes. I can estimate it before or after you wake up, right? So the mean error could be zero, right? But I'm estimating one error, one hour plus, one error minus, yeah? So it's like when you hunt, yeah? And you shoot 20 meters to the left and 20 meters to the right of the pig. Yeah, statistically, the mean, the pig is dead, but <laughs> you're still <laughs> gonna be hungry, yeah? So look at the histogram and the distribution of your, of your errors, yeah? Especially if they can be uh, two-sided. Um, yeah, different metrics can be used to reveal their strengths and weaknesses, and you should take that as an advantage and, you know, don't pick a, yeah, pick a hard metric, yeah? Don't, don't pick an easy metric, because you will only fool yourself. It's not, yeah? So the weaknesses of your approach will become apparent once they put your system into production, and then it will come back to you, yeah? That doesn't work. Okay, let me see. Uh, is this big enough? I hope. Otherwise, okay. So, um, I took the data set for today from Kaggle. Who knows Kaggle? Who has heard of Kaggle? Okay, so Kaggle is a data site where companies can post some of their data and anonymize it and then run certain challenges on the data, right? And there's also these training challenges and you can win money, you can win fame, jobs uh, on there. So you should check it out if you want to see if you learned a lot today. Um, and basically they, they offer bigger. I'll try, but I, will, I have to warn you, I have to zoom back in later, because it doesn't scale for images, apparently. Does this work? Okay. Yeah, the text is not important. It's more for you at home as a note when you download it. I hope you find it helpful. And they basically have this Titanic data set, and I decided for that, well, it's one of the most well-known data sets for beginners. It's easy to figure out what it's about, and I would have loved to show you some of my research data sets, but then I can't put the slides and the code and the data set online because, yeah, I can't do that. So, in the beginning, we have to, <laughs> we have to import some packages. Um, I have in the slides also a list of important packages and tools for you later that you can check out at home, but just for this here that we use. So Pandas is basically, it's a library that takes care of our data, right? That forms this table and it can um, perform certain operations on columns or rows or the entire table. Uh, NumPy is a library for yeah, matrix processing and math functions. Seaborn is a library that I use for plotting and also matplotlib is used, but that gets imported by this PyLab all there. Um, and I turn off warnings, but you should never turn off warnings just for demos. <laughs> um, okay, so first we need to load the data, and when you get the data from Kaggle, you get this comma separated values file. Um, that's pretty easy, but they offer, so Pandas uh, offers a lot of readers for a lot of different files. So it can read JSON, it can read from a MySQL database. Really, I, I've never had to write my own import tool with Pandas. <laughs> so yeah, CSV files it can do as well. And then we can look at the data. So, okay, now we already run into problems with the zoom. So 
maybe we look at only three rows. So then I can, yes, then I get the scroll bar. Um, so there's a passenger ID that just basically it's a running number for each passenger, it's useless. Uh, but you need it when you test because Kaggle uses that as an index. So when you up, you can later upload your forecast to Kaggle and then it needs that as an index so it knows. Yeah. Then I survived, that's our label, so either you died or you didn't. Uh, there's passenger class, which is like economy, business and first, right? It's like three classes. Uh, then there is the name of the traveler. <laughs> But that does also not really interest us because it should be unique or almost unique. <laughs> um, and yeah, it doesn't really help us in, in figuring out how their chances of survival are. Uh, there's the gender, there is age, and then there's this column called SIP SP that says how many siblings or spouses were with you. So that's kind of how many people were with you that are of your same generation, right? Because typically your spouse or your sibling kind of, yeah. Uh, and then there is this PR, that means parents and children. So that tells you uh, how many people of, the, of your parent or children generation were with you. There's the ticket number. Um, what we see there is that it's kind of not really regular. It's a bit ugly, right? It's some kind of string. So we leave that out for today, but I'm sure you can get something out of that. Uh, then there is the fare, which is basically the ticket price. Uh, the cabin number. Uh, what we can see here is that for the first and the third row, it says none. That means that the value is missing, right? And we have that a lot in data sets that you don't always have all the values for all the features. Uh, today, we take a shortcut there. But yeah, the cabin number, we also leave it out for now. And then there's a column called embarked and there's SC and one other option. And that basically tells you where that passenger entered the ship. So at what harbor. So the ship, I think it had three stops in England, I guess. And then it went across the Atlantic and met its final iceberg. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and so that tells us where they entered the ship. So first, okay, we do the cleaning part. Um, so we want to use as features, right? We said we wanted to use the passenger class, the gender, the age, the siblings and uh, spouses, uh, parents and children, uh, where they entered the boat and what they paid for the trip. And what I do here is that all the rows that have this none in in any of these columns are dropped. I just leave them out, yeah? And I put them in a new variable called clean data frame. DF stands for data frame. That's a fancy word of saying table. Uh, so that's what I call this format, yeah? And then uh, I don't want to just trust that. I want to kind of check how much data I lost in the process because if I lose like 80% of data there, I can't take this handy shortcut, yeah? Um, so I just print out some things there. So uh, I look at the shape. So the shape basically tells me how many observations and how many columns. So before I, I clean my data, there's 891 uh, lines and 12 columns. So that means there's 891 participants. And afterwards, there's only 712. So I dropped 179 participants or uh, yeah, of that boat trip and that means it's 20 equals to 20 percent, yeah. So it's quite considerable, right? Losing 20 percent in the first step of what we did. But for tonight, it has to be good enough. So I, in the end, I put a list of things that you could do from here on. And this is the first thing is. Okay, maybe if only the age is missing, right, you can assume the median age. Or if you can probably assume that most people were not traveling in first class, but they are traveling in economy, right? So you can just say, okay, if, if this feature is missing, I always assume they travel economy. Yeah? Uh, and also what we see here is uh, it was 12 columns before and it's 12 columns afterwards, so that's good. So we didn't lose any. <laughs> anything that we didn't want to lose. So 
And uh, now we can start with something that's called exploratory data analysis. So this is kind of this pre-processing step for us, but uh, some people say it's an own data science field. So sometimes you don't want to make a prediction. You just want to, you know, take this data set and say some, something about it. Um, and the first question would be like, does age and gender matter when, when I'm on this boat, whether I survive or not? Yeah? Who knows the answer? <laughs> okay, so do you think it matters? Who thinks it matters? Okay, very good. Uh, why do you think it matters? <laughs> because usually somebody will say women and children gender first. Matters. What? At least gender matters. Gender. Yeah, but usually they say in case of an emergency, it's women and children first. So, if you are a female data scientist, your chance to survive <laughs> has just increased. <laughs> so, what I do there is basically I plot a histogram where on the x axis I show the age and on the y axis I show the cases that survived and the cases that died. Uh, overlapping, yeah, for in different colors, and then I have two of these, one for males and one for females. So, and then, so basically, all of this is making it look nice. All of this is making it look nice. Ah, and what I do here is I define the bins. So I say, give me bins of five years, yeah. So from zero to five, from five to ten, for the age. I do that because otherwise I specify the number of bins and that's different for the people. So if I say give me 10 bins, it gives me 10 bins for the survivors and for the people that didn't survive. And then the bins are not the same, yeah? So it's better to have the same bins, same size bins, yeah? Um, okay, so let's compute that. Okay, and what we can see is that actually for the female passengers, you see here in orange, they are the ones that survived, right? The blue ones, or they are gray, right, if it's behind the orange part, they are the ones that died. So, actually, right, so here, the chance is like, I don't know, three to one to survive. It's not that bad at all, right? And then if you are very young, so under five years, the chance is even better that you survive, yeah? And even if you're old and female, yeah, survive. For guys, uh, it's quite interesting. I don't know. Maybe I can... So this is gender bias in action. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it looks like the same graph, right? But with the colors flipped, yeah? Except for the kids, so the kids, they get to go first. Yeah? Okay, so I think this is one of the best conclusions you can, or best things that you can see in the data set. Um, <laughs> okay, but then, yeah, we could go further, right? And we could say, does the ticket price matter? Like, will I be safer if I travel first class, right? And I have to admit that, okay, I, I compute it first. I basically do the same thing, but not split for men and women, just everyone um, gets the same treatment this time. Uh, and on the bottom I have the ticket price, yeah? And again, the blue points are, or the blue lines are the ones that, that were killed. And you can see that if you bought a cheap ticket, <laughs> you most likely did not survive. Um, but if you spend more than a hundred dollars, I think, or pounds, then your chance of survival is pretty high. Yeah? Um, to be honest, I'm not quite sure at what time the Titanic crashed. I think it was in the evening. And I think that the cabins that I mean, normally the nice cabins are like somewhere where you have a few or something like that. And so then maybe you can jump off the ship easier and maybe they were located. So I think it hit f in the front, right? And maybe the, the nice cabins were in the back or something. There, I know there's a map of this on the internet. Somebody can check if they are 
curious, not now, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but I think that it has to do something with that. I mean, should I hope? <laughs> um, exactly. And then now, okay, we're at the point where we say, okay, let's make some predictions, right? Let's build a model and see how well this works. Um, but we have to do something before that because we have these two columns. We have the column where it's written like female or male, right? Uh, here you can see, right? Female or male, it's a string. And also here this embark column is a string and yeah, machines are not good with strings so we should translate that into something machines understand, so either a number or a boolean or something like that. And for that we use something, something called one hot encoding. So for every option we make a boolean, right? Is this person female? Yes or no? Or is, is the person, uh, did they embark in port C, yes or no, right? So we do that and um, pandas is pretty cool uh, library. They have a function for that that just does it for us. Um, it's called this pd.getdummies, yeah? And I will do that. Here. Here you can see the results. So I basically made a column. Uh, I didn't pick whether it should be called female or male, as pandas did this, yeah? Um, but basically, there's a column that says, is the person male, yes or no? And at least back in the days, you could just be male or female. So if it's mutually exclusive, one column is enough, yeah? To describe that. And, um, and then there are three columns for the port. So also there, right, because I know that I dropped the NAs, I could do this in two columns, right? Because this, like, two bits are enough to encode these this states, yeah? Um, and then I have the class, the age, siblings, spouses, parents, children, and the fair. And then I also have my my label column, right? So we separate it at that point into a variable called X and a variable called Y. And X is always our feature matrix, yeah? That's that matrix I was talking about all the way in the beginning of the talk, where I said the rows are the observations and the columns are the features. And then Y is the labels, yeah? And they're called X and Y because this is the notation used by the library. You can call them features and labels whatever you want, but I followed that notation. And then we need to have a classifier. And for that, I sadly have to click to PowerPoint again, uh, because I made a few slides on the classifiers we will use. Um, so there's the knife base that basically it implements the base rule. Uh, it uses some kind of distribution to approximate data, and in our case it uses a Gaussian distribution. And basically it computes the probability uh, with this formula. This is the most mathematical slide, don't worry. <laughs> um, and then you do this for every feature and you multiply the probabilities up and you do that for every class and then the class that scores the highest probability wins so here I put an example. Um, you could say, for example, with the ticket price, right? Um, what is the probability that I survived when I paid $80 for my ticket? The probability is the probability that someone else paid $80 for the ticket and survived times the probability of surviving in general, yeah? I think in the Titanic this was like one third, two third or something. It was skewed, but not super heavily skewed, yeah? Like 33 to 66. And then I would have to do the same computation, what's the probability to die if I paid $80 for my ticket? It's the probability that if you paid $80 for your ticket you died times the probability that people died. And then I, one of them is going to be bigger and then I would say you survive or you die. It's just like that. The denominator here, uh, I left out on the bottom because 
that's the probability for paying $80, right? And it's the same for the surviving and dying case, so it doesn't matter, you can leave it out. Yeah? And then you save a division, which saves compute time. So The next kind of classifier that we will use is the decision tree classifier. So there, ah, sorry, I have to, forgot one detail. So with the knife base, the nice thing is that all you need to know about your training data is the mean and the standard deviation if you use a Gaussian function for every feature. So it's very memory efficient. Yeah? With a decision tree, uh, you basically build a decision tree. <laughs> so say you wanted to figure out whether somebody likes computer games or not, and you would know their age, gender, and occupation. Uh, I didn't construct this example. I don't know why they said that girls don't like computer games. Um, but okay, so in their data, yeah, if someone was below the age of 15 and male, there was like a strong likelihood in the data that they like computer games. Yeah, so they get this scoring, and then in the end, uh, basically, you go down the tree, and in the end, you know whether they like computer games or not. Um, I computed a graph like that for the Titanic set. We can look at it in a second. And we will use uh, boosted decision trees. Basically, there an, ex uh, an ensemble of trees is used. So you don't have one tree, but you have many trees. And each tree gives you a score. And you add them up, and uh, then you get a result. And the hypothesis there is that you have a lot of weak trees, so a lot of trees that don't perform too well. But in the, en in the ensemble, they perform very well. And this is actually a pretty good uh, method. Worked a lot for a lot of problems pretty well. Um, and you can imagine yeah, getting treated by a room full of doctors yeah, that are just good enough not to kill you individually. <laughs> but in some, if their knowledge is combined, yeah, you can you know, <laughs> be well, <laughs> yeah, recover fast. Yeah? Okay, um, so then that was, that was all this. So you made it through the slides part. Let me see here. So, okay, now uh, the first thing that we wanted to apply was the Gaussian knife base. Yeah, so all we have to do is import it from this library called uh, scikit-learn. They offer a lot of classifiers and they also offer things like the accuracy score. Yeah. So for the problem we have here, the accuracy score is pretty good because it's easy to understand. It's only one number. And the data set is not heavily skewed, so I think two thirds, one third, something like that. So it's fair to use the accuracy score. Okay, so we import the scorer and we import the, the classifier. Then all we do is we instantiate the classifier. Um, we train it, they call it fitting, unfortunately. So we train it and then we predict, yeah? And for prediction, we only need the features because of course we want to know the labels, right? And then uh, we print out the accuracy score. So let's do that. And as you can see, it's really fast, even on this kind of slow computer, yeah? Uh, but what did we do wrong? We didn't do cross-validation. So we don't know if the 77% accuracy is good or not. So let's implement cross-validation. For that, uh, yeah, we implement this cross-validation function called, or we, we import it, called stratified k-fold. Uh, k-fold or n-fold just means you split it um, n or k times, yeah? In our case, four times. And stratified means that if there is two third of the if two third of the people died and one third survived in the entire data set, yeah, here in this entire thing, then every block will resemble that distribution. So every block will have this two third one third distribution. That's important uh, because otherwise you can end up with a block where it's really unbalanced. And that can lead to, to issues. On the other hand, if you know that the distribution in your data can change, it's maybe clever to just split it randomly. 
just uh, as a word of warning, uh, activate this shuffle function. Otherwise, it just goes through the data and splits it. And a lot of times in your data, your data will be sorted by class. Yeah. So then you have the first split, all the data from one class, the next split, all the data from another class. Um, and then we import this function called crosswald score. That does the following. Uh, as I said before, it's this very high level function, right? It basically performs the training step, the prediction step, and uh, the scoring step, yeah? So it, it basically trains the model, predicts on, so it, it trains the model here on this block two, three, and four. It predicts on block one, and then it computes the accuracy of the model, and then it goes to the next step, yeah? And that's that example where I said three lines earlier, but it's more like, yeah, it's three lines if you count that you have to instantiate the estimator, yeah? So you instantiate the estimator, but we did it already here. Uh, then you instantiate the cross-validation method, and then you compute it, yeah? Uh, here is this n jobs attribute um, that uh, just tells uh, how strong you want to parallelize. With minus one, it just takes all the execution units possible. And so let's wait. So it has to do the computation four times, so that takes a bit more time. Okay, so, and what can we see here? First, we see the result for every fold, so 76, 76, 79, 74%. Um, that's pretty good. That means they are kind of balanced, right? So there shouldn't be much underfitting, overfitting, not a lot of variance, variance in the splits. And the mean result is 76%. So, yeah, it's 1% worse. Um, maybe with a different split, if we run it again, we get a bit different result. But that's pretty good, right? We already can... Uh, we already can predict whether you survived the Titanic riot or not with 76% accuracy. Um, then, okay, we can even kind of, you know, define a function that we can do all of this in one line, yeah? So, like, with the printing of the results, because we want to do that for two different classifiers. So, basically, I just put all of this here with, uh, with the printing of the results. And then I can even run it like this, and it should give a similar result. Yeah, so. But you see, because we do random shuffling of the data set, the results are a little bit different every time, yeah? And then now we can do the same for the decision tree classifier. Okay, it's 75%. <laughs> okay, so it's a bit worse, but this can be chance, yeah, one or two percent can always be chance with this size data. Uh, and with this um, call, you can export it into a, into a dot file, and the dot file you can transform into a PNG, that's what I did here. Uh, so we can actually look at how the classifier makes the decision, yeah? So at the top, it looks, is this person male or female, yeah? That's the first decision. Then, if the person is male, so means male smaller than 0 0.5, means if it's bigger than 0 0.5, so if it's true. Uh, and here you can actually see that, right? We said the, the chance for females to survive is a lot higher. So the more blue the nodes are, the higher the chance within the node to survive. And the more orange they are, the higher the chance to die. Yeah. So that's actually... The flipped color scheme. Nah, but uh, yeah, then it looks how old you are, right? So you can, with this, you can quickly see what features are important for this tree to get to a conclusion. And for every conclusion, you can walk through the tree yourself if you want and see how the decision, how the computer got to that decision. Yeah, that's something you cannot really do in a neural network. Um, and I hope that's enough motivation to go for classic machine learning. So, yeah, at, as a last option, let's try this XGBoost classifier. <laughs> so, almost 80%, so 5, yeah, 79%. But we can see the first fold was pretty good with 85%. So, yeah, you can see there the strength of the ensemble, yeah? 
So it's really better than just using one single tree. Um, and then there is just, I think, the confusion matrix left. So the confusion matrix is something that you also get from scikit-learn, but per default it looks a bit lame. So there's a nice, uh, a nice plot function. Also in their documentation, I adapted it a bit. Uh, then we can get this. So what can you see in the confusion matrix? You can see that if the person really died in the Titanic, yeah, that happened 351 plus 73 times. Yeah, so 424 times. 424 people died, yeah, that were on the Titanic. At least in our data set, 424 died. Our classifier predicted that they will die, so predicted label dead, true label dead, for 351, yeah? And for 73 participants, the classifier predicted that they will survive, yeah? And for the people that survived, it predicted, yeah, one third almost wrong, yeah? So that's maybe not so good. So if I tell you, tell me your data, I put it in there, I tell you, you survive, you say, okay, if I survive, I take the trip, because maybe we don't hit the iceberg the second time, right? The thing crashes, there's a, a one in three, or yeah, one to two chance that, yeah, I gave you the wrong advice. So yeah, there's still room for improvement, but basically there you can always go, like from the left is the true label, from the bottom is the predicted label, and this is a nice way to look at problems with a small number of classes, say two, three, four classes, because there nothing is hidden, yeah? You can see all the, all the ugly mistakes that your program made, yeah? Whereas with accuracy score, you don't see that, yeah? You, with accuracy, it can be that this number is really big, this number is really small, those numbers are smaller anyway, and then it, it washes away. Yeah? In this 5%, in this 95% example, that's really the tricky thing with boiling down all the information to one number. Yeah? It's like KPIs. If you run a startup and you pick some fancy KPI and you manage to like, trick your investor into giving you more money, but in the end, the business crashes anyway. Yeah? So it's a question whether the investor will figure that out. So this is the part that I talked about earlier. Where can you go from here? So um, that's just a few points. If you want to continue this, you can download it from GitLab and just continue there, yeah? Um, okay, so. Sorry, I'm a Linux user normally, <laughs> but for PowerPoint. Hmm. Let me see. Is this? Yes. Okay, great. So now there is no free lunch, right? So everything comes with some advertisements. <laughs> So a startup that I work with currently, and also Sebastian is part of this, um, called Smartricity. They are building a really cool app. Uh, it's about saving energy. And they're currently looking for a front-end developer. So if you have front-end development skills and some free time on your hands, talk to one of the three guys in the picture. Uh, and the other advertisement is I'm currently building a smartphone app that can detect sleep based on your smartphone use and the smartphone sensors. So you don't need to interact with the app at all. It's like, it's like a sleep tracker in your smartphone. And you don't need to put the smartphone under the pillow or anything like that. And I see that intrigues you. <laughs> Um, and um, I want to kind, so I did this as a research project, I published a paper on it, there was this, this thing built there by some students of mine, and so now I would like to launch it as an app, so we need to recode everything, and I'm kind of looking for people that have experience with Firebase, with Android, got it, want, want to build this. Um, 
and I wanted to start building this this weekend. Um, so I don't know if you know, but there's the incubator and they're hosting an innovation challenge, like a hackathon. And basically this is one of the projects that you can work on there. If you say, I don't want, I don't care about sleep. <laughs> I want to work on smart city stuff. Then also that might be interesting. Uh, but you have to be fast. You have to check it out tonight because I think today is the last day where you can sign up. Um, and then this is my email address, Twitter handle, LinkedIn profile if you want to get in touch. Um, and there's also the GitHub, uh, GitLab link. And you can get the slides, the code there. Yeah. And so now I think we can. I will switch this screen to the Twitter thing and see if. Did anyone tweet? So Twitter is that. Okay, then I take your questions. <laughs> as well in person if you want. So thanks for your attention. Yeah? So there's some Twitter. Okay, let's see. Twitter. So somebody used that hashtag before in 2000. Ah, which learning material would you recommend to newcomers in data science and Python? Um, <laughs> to me, I learned it organically. I, I started with MATLAB and then we switched to Python because MATLAB was becoming too expensive. Um, and so I had data sets and stuff, but Kaggle is a good resource. So try this Titanic challenge on Kaggle. And because the cool thing is a lot of people wrote blog articles about the challenge. So you can just Google I, things and read their ideas. Um, then what I use a lot when I program is this documentation for Pandas and sklearn and so on. They have really, really, really well documented uh, packages, yeah? <laughs> and they, for example, with scikit-learn, they give you an example for every classifier. For example, this confusion matrix plot, they give you a complete example with data set and everything. It's pretty simple. Um, what do I recommend to start otherwise? Oh, yeah, there is a YouTube channel. I have to look it up. Sendex is the name. I, I will, I don't know, maybe I can. Can I? No. I don't. Input text. Okay. Let's see. Ah, you can see live. Cool. Yeah, Sentex. Uh, that comes from Sentiment Index because this guy built like, you know what sentiment analysis is? So if you look at a lot of tweets and you figure out are they mad or are they happy? <laughs> Something like that. He did that for stocks and he's selling that through an API. But this guy has an insane YouTube amount of YouTube content. And he does really everything. He does deep learning. He did a really cool series on deep learning where he would drive motorcycles in GTA 5 with deep learning. Uh, he does stuff on stock analysis with Python. Yeah, really, that guy is pretty good. Um, there is OpenAI. I, I'm not sure if that still exists. It's like one of Elon Musk's side projects where uh, they give you different uh, problems, but it's more about deep learning, I think, as well. Um, what else is good? I think there are a lot of courses, but I don't know. I, I think uh, the best way to learn it is if you find a problem where you can really apply it, like in your job or in your home or yeah, with some data that you have and really where you really have a motivation to to get something out of the data, yeah? I think maybe that, that would help the most, yeah? Okay, any more? Let me see, did anybody else tweet in the meantime? <laughs> First time I tried that, probably last time too. Okay, what I do I think about TensorFlow? Um, TensorFlow, uh, yeah, I think 
there is good and bad sides to it. I mean, it's nice that there's these libraries that make machine learning really easy, right? Whether it's classic machine learning or not. Also sklearn, right? You see that with few lines of code you can run a classifier, but that also means that a lot of people that maybe don't really understand what they're doing try it and get frustrated by it, or they will try to sell you their data scientist services or something, and they don't really know what they're doing. On the other hand, yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, they have, I think they started a marketplace now also for models. So what I recently heard about is transfer learning, where basically, the, as I said, the problem with neural nets is you need a massive data set, right? And if you're not Google, you don't have a massive data set. That's, or Facebook, or you know, like. And so what you do in transfer learning is you, trans, you, you learn your neural network once at Google with their servers and their data. For example, to recognize objects in images, right? And then you will take the learned model and with a little bit of your data, with your small data set or medium sized data set, you retrain that model, but you don't forget everything. You, you, know, you just add your data to the model. And you basically, by doing that, you transfer your model, like the existing model, into your problem domain. I think that's really cool if that works, but it still won't be able to explain the reasoning behind it. And that's, I mean, to me, that's the biggest downside. So if, say, I would have a business, and in that business, some algorithm would do some work, right? I would not trust an algorithm where I don't understand how it works because how, I mean, then I would have to check it constantly, yeah? And then I can just do the work myself. So then I don't need the algorithm. Or I trust it, but then I need to know, I mean, or I trust it and I don't check up on it and then it increases efficiency, right? Or I have to do less work or whatever, yeah? And if that's the case, well, then I wouldn't pick a deep learning algorithm. Because if I don't know how it works just because it got 99.8% accuracy on the test, on, on my data set that I have labeled, right, doesn't mean that it's not going to screw up my business for me tomorrow, yeah? But maybe this is quite a, I'm also biased, yeah, in that sense. But I think there's a lot that you can do with classic machine learning if you have limited size data set and labels are always expensive, so. Yeah, I think it's, you can, you can give TensorFlow a chance if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, I always wanted to try it for a while, but also I think that you need a lot of compute power. So you will need like a decent GPU, I think, to get somewhere. Don't know. Sarah, what? Ah, what do you think is the most upcoming trend in data science? <laughs> What is the most upcoming trend? That's, I think this transfer learning is, uh, I mean, if they manage to get this transfer learning thing working and they find a way to better explain what's happening inside the neural net, they fine, I'll, I'd be happy about that. Um, but I think that people are also getting more worried about privacy and the way that data is split. So if you look now at your data in the cloud, right, on the internet, basically if it's personal data, it's either at Apple or at Google or maybe in one of the Amazon warehouses, right? I'm not talking about Amazon, the shopping website. I'm talking about Amazon, the cloud computing provider, yeah? And so maybe some yeah, maybe more local, local computing stuff gets more interesting again. We'll see what's the, the most upcoming trend. And I think this, this web interfaces uh, are nice. So they are, for us, the, the biggest advantage is that we are now at work. When we do something for clients, we, we don't do PowerPoints anymore. <laughs> we, we build web apps, yeah, and then we, we show them the web app and the clients can play with their own data. 
So they really love that because normally they see PowerPoints all the day. <laughs> and then when you show them something that's not a PowerPoint, they are naturally excited. Um, so yeah, other, yeah? Uh, yes, I dropped that slide due to timing, but let's see. I have, I have the slide in another slide deck, one second. You can do that, it's no problem. It's just the matrix gets bigger. Um, let me see. I have a, a really nice example of that actually. It's the stack. Mm. So, yeah. Ah, okay. Very similar slide, I guess. Here. Ah, here. So there basically I used the eyeglasses that I talked about earlier and I recorded a uh, data set and then I tried to figure out what people are doing. Yeah. So here is a good example also that labels are expensive because <laughs> basically we had a student following the person all day long. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, and basically saying, okay, they were eating from 12.15 to 12.35, yeah? But that's the only way to get this data in an accurate way, yeah? So it's really, the, I still feel bad for these guys, but what you do, yeah, you have basically here the classes, so like no, acti like no activity that fits any of the classes, eating, walking, brushing the teeth, walking stairs, jogging, cycling, reading, screen work, and cleaning, and then you can exactly see what goes wrong, right? So for example here, uh, in 20% of all cases, cycling was classified as eating, yeah? And in 50% of all cases, it was detected as cycling. So cycling worked pretty bad, but if you have this multi-class problem and use the confusion matrix, uh, basically you focus on the diagonal of the matrix, yeah? Because that's where the correct classifications are. This is um, normalized, so from zero to one, so like zero to a hundred percent, yeah, not not absolute counts. But this makes no sense at a matrix that size, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more? Yeah, there's not really a false positive. There's just uh, you classified into the wrong class, right? Somehow, you know what I mean? Like a false positive is <laughs> when you do a pregnancy test <laughs> and it says you're pregnant, but you're not, right? But when you when you when you're cycling and it says that you're eating, it's not the same false positive as when you are like cycling and it says you're walking, right? So there you don't really have this, this notion. You would have to add all the false positives up. So do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's a bit different. So for example, if you would compute the, hmm. let me see. Oh, no, no. So for the precision and recall, for example, you can still compute it, but you would have to sum up the, the errors from all the different classes where I did the wrong job. No. But it's possible. Just, yeah, as you see here, right, this was 10 classes and the matrix grows, grows fast, yeah? So, but it's good if you get like a dark line on the diagonal, then you know your system works, yeah? Questions, more questions. Okay. If there are no more questions on Twitter, and you have no more questions, 
No. So no more Twitter surveys and talks then. Um, no more questions? Because then Sebastian gave me some slides. Mm. Yes, okay, so. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks.